It's good afternoon. Morning, it was morning. Now we are again in the afternoon session. So my job is made easy by the previous two uh, talks because they have spoken on the gestational diabetes and diabetes in pregnancy. But we know that there are a lot of women who will come first time in pregnancy, but they will be already having diabetes. So there may be two situations. Either they may be having diabetes beforehand and they don't know and they get pregnant and then they check themselves and then we diagnose them as diabetes or they may already be knowing. So a better situation would be that if they already know so we can do a better job for them. Once they become pregnant and they are di having diabetes, we have to continue with the pregnancy and accordingly treat. Now, whenever we are talking about the goals, like what are we trying to do? So most important is the preconceptional counseling because many times they will ask that I am planning for a pregnancy and the moment you tell them you might need insulin, you will need insulin during your pregnancy, especially if it's a type two who is on oral anti-diabetic drug, a type one will definitely be continued on insulin only. So they, they get quite panicky sometimes and they don't take it very, like they don't find it okay and sometimes they try to defer. So we have to counsel them about that and we have to tell them that what happens to their insulin regimen because most of the times, suppose even if a type two diabetes patient who is on insulin, maybe a premix shot twice a day, will definitely need uh, to be shifted to a basal bolus which is more convenient to adjust and easy and also good for the mother as well as for the fetus because we can do a better job with that. And we have to optimize their lifestyle choices before that. Because all of a sudden the woman becomes pregnant and we cannot tell her to optimize everything on that day. So it has to start before because nowadays people do come for preconception counseling and they are aware that this has to be done and most of the gynecologists are referring the patients for preconception counseling. So it's very important that we tell them what all needs to be done during the pregnancy time and the most important is the achievement of the goal of HbA1c. We have to try to achieve it below 6.5. If we are not causing much problems, we should minimize the hypoglycemia, but try to achieve the HbA1c target of below 6.5. And inculcate the habit of self-monitoring. Because all of a sudden, as I said, if the day she becomes pregnant and we tell her everything when she is having nausea and vomiting, she will not be able to do it. So it's better to tell her that this needs to be done, inculcate the habit, let her do it few times in a week so that she gets into the habit of doing it. It makes your life easy and the patient makes, takes it better. So that's another way of doing a counseling when they are coming to you. Now this Dr. Uh, Shalini has already alluded to, so I'm not going to the details of this because we know that if the glucose levels are not controlled pre-conception, uh, pre these all problems ranging from the problems in the neonate immediate to the time when the neonate grows up into an adult happens. So it's very important that we need to take care of this part very seriously because otherwise the problems to both the fetus and the new one and who is going to be an adult in future will be there and we are going to create an epidemic more of diabetes and obesity. So we know this, we have discussed about that we have to have the cutoffs because we have the data from the HAPO study. So this was already discussed. Now I'll go to the preconception targets. This, if a woman has type one or type two, we are targeting a, the slides are moving oh, again, the same story. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize only. Slides, you don't move here, you don't move here. You don't move here, you don't move here, you don't move here. <laughs> I also didn't realize for you, I realized from ah, now we have re so this previous though we have already finished. This this I have already spoken to Dr. Shani already talked about it, so I'm not going into the detail. This is the HAPO study data. So preconception targets is what I was talking about. So we need to have HB1C cutoff of below 6.5. And the type 2 diabetes patients who are on oral anti-diabetic drugs, we have to shift them to insulin with metformin, and that's what we do before they plan for conception. Now, preconception counseling, first of all, the glycemic control prior to counseling has to be talked to. We have to see the uh, HbA1c, we have to see the thyroid levels also because many of them may be having hypothyroidism, may be having some thyroid dysfunction. The creatinine, the urine protein has to be seen and the lipid profile is very important and also retinopathy. So these are the things which need to be looked into and we have to see that they are not on any teratogenic drugs. It doesn't mean only the oral anti-diabetic drugs. They may be on ACE inhibitors, they may be on ARBs. All that has to be changed. So we have to see the whole scenario, not only our anti-diabetic drugs because they may be on anti hypertensive drugs. They may be taking a lot of vitamins or some supplements which may not be safe during the first trimester. So all these things have to be adjusted. So see the full prescription and adjust, that's a better way of doing the 
titration of the tablets as well as the dose. And retinopathy screening is very, very important. It has to be done preconception, then every trimester, and once in three months postpartum, after three months postpartum. Now, a few, few slides on the special considerations in uh, the type of diabetes. Like if we have a type 1, we know that they will have an increased risk of hypoglycemia in the first trimester. It would be a good idea to think about CGM monitoring in such patients in su because these are the patients who actually need it and a more better monitoring of glucose values should be done preconception as well as when they conceive, we have to titrate the insulin dose, tell them to monitor more frequently and do the titration. Hypoglycemia unawareness is a big problem in this group of patients because they may be mostly having hypoglycemia unawareness. Again, monitoring becomes very, very important. And we, we know that even at a lower value of glucose, they are running, going to, they, they run the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And also important that if they get, like who are unable to eat sometimes, these type one will have lots of vomiting, so they will require a higher amount of dextrose with an insulin drip to meet the higher carb demands which they have. So that is also very important because if the 5% may not do a good job for them. So they will require 10% at that time. And if obviously if they land up with complications, their risk of stillbirth is higher and CGM has to be recommended for these group of patients. So the special things about type 2, we know that they have a higher risk of eclampsia, preeclampsia, and hypertension, so we need to be watchful for that. For Modi, a very uh, thing is like most of the times preconception, these women will not be requiring, but when, we, when they conceive, we have to see what, what happens to the fetus. So if there is a macrosomia hap happening, we know that the baby is not carrying the genotype and then the woman needs to be treated because then the baby will be harmed if we don't take care of the glycemic levels of the woman. But if the baby is not becoming macroscopic, then the baby is, has inherited a GCK mutation and treatment is not mostly needed. Now coming to the dietary part of it, Dr. Chitra uh, alluded to uh, it in her talk. So what we basically need to see is that they need to have a three meals, two snacks uh, type of a dietary plan. And uh, though ACOG recommends a carb, a carb intake of 33 to 40% and a protein intake of 20, but uh, normally what we say is like a carb intake of like 175 grams is what is recommended by ADA and a protein intake is very important because if you see in most of your patients, their protein intake is abysmally low actually. So we need to see that even if they are vegetarians, they take the adequate protein in the form of dal or pulses or sprouts because this all needs to be seen and milk. All these things have to be added because sometimes they are not taking it at all. They have a lot of notions about diet during pregnancy and even later also during lactation. So all these things have to be taken care of and they think if they eat only white rice and the baby will be born like with the different colors so all these things are there in their mind these are the uh, local things which we need to take care of because if we don't go into that you may tell all the diet and they may not follow it and complex calf definitely should be preferred but doesn't mean that we can't tell a woman to take white rice she can but we have to tell her to add more of salads and green vegetables and dal to it that makes it a complex calf so that's how we change the diet not in the first trimester when she is vomiting we tell her to take some different type of diets which which we think is good for her. So that's how we adjust the diet. It has to be custom based, not custom made, not like whatever we think is important. It has to be made like that for the patient so that the patient can comply. If she's taking non-veg diet, we can tell her to add egg white for her breakfast every day. So all these things can be done. And we have to see that saturated fats don't increase, across more than 10%. So this is a basic idea about the calorie intake, which we can tell them uh, if they are underweight or normal weight or overweight or obese. But this is, again, not hard and fast because sometimes they may have vomitings. They may not be able to take properly. There may be some other issues. So we have to just, this is a basic idea about the calorie intake. I'm not going to the depth of it, but this is basically for underweight for the first trimester is 30, normal is, again, 30, and we can go for 24 and 12. But we can have higher if there are issues we feel. The weight gain is like, for normal weight women, 11 kg in the whole of pregnancy is what is fair enough for them. 7 kg is for overweight and 5 kg is for class 1 obesity. For higher, we don't have very clear-cut guidelines actually. So if you see the data is not very clear-cut for the higher obesity ranges. And mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. if we do that care, that we can reduce the risk of preeclampsia, we can reduce the risk of cesarean delivery and obviously mm -hmm. the postpartum mm -hmm. problems also.
this is very important. This has to be done in consultation with the gynecologist because sometimes they might have had a cervical stitch or they are on bed rest. We can't even tell them to walk. So that is why I always ask what your gynecologist has told because sometimes they think that it's the endocrinologist's word of mouth, well, the endocrinologist is word of God and the endocrinologist is telling, no, I have to walk, I have to walk, even though they might be on bed rest. So you have to be very clear. First ask what your gynecologist has told. If the gynecologist has told, it's okay to do your normal work exercise, no problem. You can advise this much basic. And uh, like after the meals also, like once they have taken the food and they should not immediately go off to sleep, they can do a mild walk in the house only so that they feel better. And even on evenings, if they have time, they should do. So that is what we tell them. That's a bare, bare minimum. There are a lot of other exercises which can be told to them, but depends on individual type of patients. So we can't have a blanket exercise statement for all. It has to be as per their gynecological and the obstetrical status also. The glycemic targets are almost the same. The fastings should be maintained below 95. If you maintain below 92, it's good. 120 to, uh, like, uh, for the two hours and 140 for the one hour. But if you maintain around 130 for the one hour, it's always good. And the HbA1c target has to be maintained preferably below seven. But if the hypoglycemia risk is too high, then at least we should try to be below, uh, sorry, below six. And if the hypoglycemia risk is too high, we should try to be below seven. We have only the time in range criteria for the CGM for type 1s in pregnancy. We don't have for type 2, but in pregnancy for type 1, they have given this that it, the, uh, the glucose range we can maintain between 60 to 140, but we mostly try to maintain around 70 with more than 70% in this range and less than 25% of the time above range, which they have taken as above 140, less than 4% below 63 and less than 1% below 54. We obviously don't want the below 54 at all. This is a very important slide because we need to understand what we need to do because sometimes we just forget to do the retinopathy checking. We forget things like lipids. So we don't think like a normal person, patient is coming for pregnancy workup and we are just doing that. So we have to see that HbA1c's, TSH, the triglycerides might be needed if, if it was borderline high. And we, we have to do for like liver functions at baseline. When the woman has come to you, this is mostly in the preconception stage also when she comes, we always do and calculate the FIB4 score and other things. And obviously the preeclampsia labs are also very important because especially the type two diabetes women are at a very high risk of getting preeclampsia and uh, pregnancy induced hypertension and retinopathy checking with the dilated exam fundus examination is needed. This is one of the important things. And we also know that hypertension preeclampsia, as I told you, is higher. And the, these women need to be screened more frequently. We need to check the urine protein. We need to check their blood pressure. We need to check the weight gain. We need to see for symptoms of fetal edema. All these things could be markers. So these are very important. And we have to see the safer drugs in pregnancy for hypertension because it happens many times they, they are continuing the ACE inhibitors and they don't know because they, I'm con so many times the gynecologist will always ask, but sometimes it gets missed or by the time they get the first test done, it may be already three months. So it's always, always important to see their antihypertensive drugs before you decide on anything or they plan for conception because that's also very important. During labor and delivery, there may be a little bit difficult situations. We, for type one, we have to continue the insulin. If it's a normal labor happening, then we have to just uh, see the glucose values, give the infusion, that's the safest. Otherwise, if she's eating, then for the initial time, for the uh, first two stage of labor, we can continue with the subcute and then see what is happening because sometimes they are not uh, but, uh, sure if they are going for cesarean and they may like to keep them NPO. So all those situations we have to see on a case-to-case -case basis. For type two, very small dose of insulin if they were requiring, by the time they enter into second stage, they may not require, we have to just monitor. But in case the glucose values are going high, we can manage with IV insulin infusion versus the subcute if the requirements are too high pre uh, the in before the labor. But we also have to keep on monitoring because the requirement of the insulin will suddenly drop and they may go into hypoglycemia. So it's very important to monitor strictly at that point of time because sometimes, as I told you, they may be going for cesarean sections and the gynecologist might not be sure. She may say that I'll decide after two hours, three hours. So we'll have to see that during time, that time they might be NPO. So then we have to manage with IV fluids with the infusion. If they're going for cesarean section, then IV insulin infusion with the IV fluids is the safest thing to do. And not to forget, she's delivered and she's going to lactate the child. So we have to encourage lactation. We have to tell them to lactate. And we have to counsel them about diet again because this is the point of time I feel maximum problems I see post-delivery. The, during the uh, pregnancy, they, are, they will follow to the book, whatever we say. But the moment they deliver, they'll never 
come back to you and they'll come back maybe after two years with some complications. So that's why this counseling is very important when they are lactating or when they have delivered and going home, you have to tell them again about the diet because again, there are a lot of dietary uh, misconceptions among public which needs to be sorted out as per the local areas. And we have to see that they take a good carb intake. They should not stop the carbs and not try a keto diet and other things during this time at all because sometimes they are in a hurry to lose weight and they may do all this. So that should not be the time when it is to be done. The basal insulin requirement may come down in the initial months of lactation. So we have to monitor again. Again, the importance of monitoring comes. Metformin can be continued in type two, but we also have to see that if suppose um, the baby is too low birth weight or baby has some complications, sometimes we prefer to give insulin to the mother till the baby is better. Otherwise, metformin is quite safe for breastfeeding women. But for type one, we have to continue the insulin. The requirement of insulin may be lower. For type two, we, if uh, with metformin, the glucose values are not controlled, we have to give insulin. That's the safest when the woman is breastfeeding her child. But counseling about diet and monitoring and screening for the complications in future is important because, and we always have to club it with the visit when they come for the child's vaccination. That's the best way to do the thing. So we have to make arrangements that we see them on that day. Otherwise, they'll not come again. So that's for their benefit. So I think we did that.